outside the box with Jeff Conine. We have a special episode. It should really just be outside the box with the Conines today because I've got Jeff Conine on my left, Griffin Conine on my right, and we have the World Series later today, which is what it'll be for the people listening. I know we're recording it the night before, but this is fun. I've had these conversations a million times with you two, but never in a podcast setting, talking baseball, a lot to unpack. And now I got to guess two jerseys. So I just can't go over two. Can't go over two. That'd be, that'd be bad karma right now. Yeah. So obviously I know it's one Astros, one Braves. Griff, you finally get to go on your dad's podcast. You were traveling all over the country. You're living in Beloit. Uh, and I'm, we're going to talk about some minor league housing situations. You got the promotion over to Pensacola, which I think after Beloit probably sounded like, you know, heaven on earth. Um, and that was a pretty cool opportunity to be a little bit closer to home, but people don't realize how far Florida is from like tip to tip. And I didn't realize until I did a similar drive. So it was still pretty far. So how good does it feel to just be home? Really good. Really good. Pensacola was definitely a, a good step as far as city. Cause Beloit was about the bottom of the barrel as far as, uh, living places to live uh and then Pensacola was nice but also a lot different even though it's still Florida it was just a completely different vibe than like you know South Florida totally different like it didn't feel like really Florida except for the beaches um but definitely happy to be home back in the comfort zone and you were able to you know hit a little bit of Marlins Park you sent me some awesome videos there uh swing looks great of course and get your work in but also kind of finding that balance of relaxing a little bit, unplugging a little bit, but still trying to stay fresh. And now that you're home and, you know, with your dad and how has that balance been of trying to find that, you know, you want to kind of clear your head a little bit. It's a long draining season emotionally, physically, but you also kind of want to stay fresh a little bit. I, I want to kind of pivot to, to Jeff here. Cause I mean, you've done this, this cycle so many times as a ball player, you know, what, what's kind of your advice to Griff as he comes home here, you know, what did you tell him for everyone to kind of understand of finding that balance between staying on it and keeping your mind in the right place, but also like relaxing a little bit and, and clearing your head? Yeah, I mean, with that stage of my career, when I was in double A, I'd come home and I'd take a couple weeks off and I'd jump right back into it. And, um, you know, I, I played a lot of racquetball too. So that was kind of my off season conditioning program was I'd start playing a lot of racquetball, but, uh, it's, it was tough for me to grasp not getting back into baseball quickly because that's just what I, I was a professional baseball player. So I'm, I'm playing ball all the time. Well, as the years got along and my knowledge expanded uh, of really how much time I need to get ready and, and uh, prepared for the season, it started backing up. So um, I would say after probably, you know, three, four, five years in the league, I decided that I didn't need to touch a baseball or a bat until January. So that was kind of my uh, set time. When that, when that calendar changed, that's kind of when my mindset changed. And that's when I really got into baseball mode. I started doing baseball specific stuff on the field. Um, but up until then it was more uh, workouts. I, I was in the weight room doing my weight workouts and all that stuff and then, and racquetball mainly. But, um, you know, I know he's eager to get back at it and it's kind of, uh, unfathomable to him to take off two months from baseball and not do anything. It just, he's never done that. So, um, but you need time off from this game and it is a grind. It's such a long season uh, just for your peace of mind uh, more than anything is just to, just to get away from it and, and let it simmer for a while until you get that, that juice is flowing again. And I think the calendar turning for me was that, was that time. Well, and the crazy thing about it is, is baseball really never stops. Florida, especially. I mean, I remember when I would play summer ball, I actively wanted to lose in those summer ball tournament games. I, really, it just, I was like, we're not winning at all. I, I don't, I want to go home. It's hot. I'm tired. I just played a full high school season. I played a full fall season. And you've got guys right now, like in the Arizona Fall League. And I, I just can't imagine uh, just going out there and just continuing to go and go and go. Uh, there's, there's a tough balance because baseball is also a game of reps, right? And you've got to get so many reps and you've got to get the muscle memory and, and you're doing it right now with, with your players at FIU uh, and, and you're, you know, getting these guys ready to go early. Now it's still way ahead of when we're going to see the season, but it's slowly creeping up. How much has had as really kind of helping Griffin through his baseball career, seeing him go through the college 
ranks and go through high school and everything like that. How has that helped you as a coach now? And then I want to ask Griff about what it's like seeing, um, you know, his dad coach now you know, in that kind of context, but how much did it help to just being able to have Griffin go through the ranks and kind of serving as his built-in uh, offhand, like kind of hands off with built-in coach through the years to being able to translate and relate to your players now at FIU? Well, it was, it was uh, quite different because, you know, uh, Griffin was far away at Duke. I was working with the Marlins at the time. Um, so I'm here at home. And um, uh, after we were let go, you know, I got a season where we could go up and see him often, but I never really understood what the fall season was like compared to the spring season. Um, we're at a full bore right now. We got four scrimmages a week, uh, one or two practices a week. Um, and the thing that kind of sucks is that you get six, no, we get 10 weeks, 10 weeks of pretty intense training, get all these guys ready to go. And then boom, they have to leave and we don't get to see them again for almost two months. So <laughs> November 17th is our drop dead date. That's when the NCAA says we have to stop. There's no more coaching or instruction after that. They're on their own until January 10th when they come back to school. So you hope that the programs that, me, that you give them to uh, try to keep their skills at a high level um, for those eight, 10 weeks, they diligently do. So when we come back January 10th, you know, cause the season starts just five or six weeks later and it's full go. That's when games start counting. So it's a, uh, it's a short period of time to really get um, sharp and um, back into shape, I think. So it's a weird chopped up season. And for Griff, you know, Aside from the five minutes that Bob Nightingale anointed your dad, the manager of the Marlins, your dad, you've never really seen your dad in a coaching capacity because he, as long as I knew you, at least I know you helped out off and you came on the field, but you never really wanted to be that head coach. No, but my dad well, never wanted to do that ever. You did? You did it? 11 year old, 11 year old Western Rattlers. I was Western the head Rattlers. coach, man. How annoying were the parents? Oh my God. Exactly. So I you stopped I had, for a reason. I had, I had tryouts for parents, not players. <laughs> so beyond that like my dad did it when we were 11 he's like I'm done I'm good I had that memory it was great and then that was that was it how has it been watching your dad now go all in and in, in this now new job new phase of as a manager or as, as a manager as as a coach now in college and uh just I could tell I mean I I see you all in on this Jeff it's been so cool to see you just get so into it and uh, how much passion you have to, to teach these kids. I get to see you in your element a little bit, uh, catching you right before practice when I went to F FIU. Griff, how's it been seeing your dad now turn into this uh, college baseball coach? Yeah, it's weird. It's a change. <laughs> it's weird. It's, it's weird. Uh, it's been really cool, though. I mean, it's been fun uh, talking about players. You know, we talk yeah. about the players, you know, the hitters, the swings. You know, I always love talking about swings. And um, it's fun just uh, – learning about, you know, how he's adjusting to a different situation where, you know, you're in charge of 40 guys now, which is crazy. Uh, and it's a lot to handle, but, um, it's fun, you know, it's really cool and, uh, cool to be around and, uh, kind of learn about, you know, what, what the college sphere kind of looks like these days, you know, yeah. I'm now three years removed. So it's, it's kind of fun just being put back into what it's like to be, uh, four four scrimmages a week you know fall ball indies um you know it's kind of like a blast from the past I feel like I'm back in it and I, I can kind of feel where all those players are coming from and um definitely it's cool see, hearing about uh the the practices like what they're what they're doing and, and how the players are responding because I know yeah. exactly what they're feeling when when he's telling me that you know they they face a machine throwing upper 90s and the guys are hating it just because they're you know they're getting blown up by it and I was, I just put myself in my, in those shoes, you know, when I was that age, uh, I would be kind of the same way. And it's cool seeing here now the better players will, will respond differently. And, um, and definitely hearing about their swings, like certain problems guys have. And then I kind of feel like I might know a little bit about like why there, that might be an issue for them. Um, cause I, you know, I've been through it, you know, I had the same issues even now, you know, hitting so hard that we never figure it out. Um, but it's, it's been a lot of fun just, just being a part of it. The really interesting just component and dynamic of that is, you know, your dad is helping you so much with your professional career and the mental side of it and just everything that goes into that. And now with your dad's new endeavor, 
you can really help him with relating to players and understanding where they're at. Cause you say three years, like it's a long time, but you can really align with the mindset of these players and you know what it's like to be a college baseball player today. Cause it's a little bit different than what it was when even, you know, Jeff played. And that's the cool thing is you guys are almost collaboratively working with each other here to, to help each other with your endeavors. And now you get ready for next year. And we talk about the whole component of, of just relaxing, but then starting to ramp it back up and everything. Can you say from your perspective, kind of what you learned this year, and then also some of you know what your dad has kind of helped you learn in terms of what you came away with? Because this, on a macro scale, insane year. I mean, nobody, very few guys, except for MJ Melendez, and I don't know where it fi- finished up, maybe one or two other guys, which was really cool to see uh, you know, Jeff's, the other coach at FIU, the head coach at FIU, his son launching home runs too you had a great year. You launched a ton of homers. You got the promotion to double a, a lot of awesome things and still a lot more that you want to be able to accomplish and a lot more consistency that you want to find. What would you say some of your biggest takeaways were from this year and then coming home? Yeah. You know, how much more did you learn just from bouncing some of that stuff off your dad? Yeah, I think the biggest, one of the biggest things uh, is just for the off season patterning, you know, a, a setup and like, you know, whether it comes down to stance and, uh, and swing that I can stick with. Cause I think if you like, it was funny that at, at the Marlins, uh, at the instructs camp we did at Marlins park, they, uh, for, at w- w- a couple of days, they did a mashup of like all the hitters that were there. They put all like their best swings of the season uh, on the scoreboard in center field. Like while we were taking BP, I guess just to like kind of pump us up. And, uh, and if you look at mine, it was like, if you really paid attention, then you could see like, each one, there was very few that looked the same as far as my setup and like my stance even. And, uh, and you look at other guys and like, they're, you know, they're doing the same thing every time and you can't change that much and, and have consistency. It's just too hard. Uh, so I think that was something that I kind of fell into the trap of this year was I uh, always felt like I was, I was tinkering, tinkering, you know, the whole year, which is you, you want to make small adjustments, but I was making like big ones. And, uh, and that would, you know, become really hard to, to repeat and every day kind of felt a little different. So um, one of the biggest things is just is for the off season is just sticking with one, you know, picking one, one setup, one swing, one approach. And then um, that way you can get comfortable with it. And uh, so when I, you know, when I start hitting again, that's going to be the main goal is just same day, same thing every day, same thing every day and just repeat it, repeat it, get comfortable with it. And then that's when you can really uh, kind of clear that part out and then focus on, you know, what the pitcher's trying to do to you, which I feel like I did so little of this year. I was so wrapped up in what I was doing in the box that like I was, uh, had no space left to, to process, you know, counts and approaches and game situations. So um, that's kind of, that's it for me. That's, you know, that's, I think once I figure that out, it'll just open the door for, for a lot of good things to happen. Well, the amazing thing about that is a lot of good things already did happen, right? You almost hit 40 home runs and you had such a strong year, Uh, with your power output and you were able to see get a taste of what you're capable of which is limitless potential when it's all clicking I mean when when you were you talk about sticking with something when you were going through the stretches where you stuck with something and had a good stretch of a couple weeks I mean it was like every time I checked my phone there was a home run you know I text your dad home run and he'd be like another one and I was like, no, 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 he just hit that. And he's like, no, 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 like he just hit another one. <laughs> and I was like, no way. <laughs> like that happened on multiple occasions. So that's that idea of like when it's going right, you, you felt it and it's just sticking with that. And the funny thing about that is that your dad, Jeff had most, one of the more simple, repeatable swings that you'll ever see. And a lot of people will ask me, you know, one question that they wanted. I was, I was right before we got on the podcast, I was finishing up the Just Baseball show. And I said, hey, do you guys have any questions uh, that you want me to bounce off of uh, off of the conines uh, before I hop on the episode. And Peter, he, he basically just said, like, oh, what are the, what are the big differences? Obviously, uh, Griffin has power that you can't teach and is in the f- first percentile of, of all of professional baseball. But what do you see as the big differences in terms of the type of player you are than your son? And then the second part to that question, if you remember it, I can I can throw that second part after is does he remind you of anybody that you played with or against from your playing days? I thought that was a really interesting question. Um, I think we're, we're very different players uh, with very different skill sets. Um, you know, 
obviously I didn't have that kind of power. You know, he had more home runs in uh, by the I don't know, third week of a ball this year than I did my entire double A season. So, um, and it's not only just power, it's just where he's hitting him too. You know, yeah. uh, majority of home runs were from to the left of center field for him, which is opposite field, which uh, like you said, you just can't teach that kind of swing. You can't teach that kind of contact point deep like that. You can't teach that kind of bat speed that will produce home runs to the opposite field. I mean, I think I had 214 home runs in my whole career and probably 15 of them were to opposite field. You know, I was a pull side guy. That's all I could do is pull side. Uh, I was very uh, rotationally, rotationally inflexible where Griff is very, very flexible rotationally. So, you know, he can get a lot more um, like accelerate more before the ball and let it slow down after where I had to do it in a shorter period of time. So I had to have my swing as simple as possible because when I started trying to get movement in it, when I started trying to do leg kicks, anything like that, stuff really fell apart for me. So I just kept it very simple um, with hands, with feet. Uh, I tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, but, you know, as far as skill set is concerned, he's got a way better arm than I ever had. Uh, we're probably about pretty even on speed, I would think. Um, uh, Lucy disagrees. What's that? I think Lucy, Lucy thinks Griff's faster. Yeah. Lucy, hey, no, no, I'm faster. <laughs> I was faster. Um, and uh, the other the other part of the question about does he rem what does his swing remind me of anyone's um, that I played with or against? Or against. Um, I don't know. I've never really thought about it. I've I never, never really thought, thought about, about it either. And I, I've never, I, I can't like, nothing really pops out at me. Um, I'll say someone with the Marlins gave me the Giambi comp. And that's I a sick comp. Some of him, and I was like, that's pretty, you know, what couple of the stances that I chose. Well, yeah, year. I guess it, I, I guess it depends on what stance he chose at what period of time. Yeah. Well, which that. Griffin are we talking that. about? Right. <laughs> Yeah, but Giambi was, man, he was one of the best hitters in our league uh, while he was playing. He was a stud. Like that guy could absolutely rake, um, not only for power but average as well. This guy, um, but he was very simple. He didn't have a whole lot of forward movement. He was more of a rotational type hitter, yeah. which I think Griff is too. He's very good rotationally. Um, during the quarantine, when I put the cage up and and Griff started me messing around with like a Bonds type swing, you know, uh, he could do that. So. You know, I told him, man, you got to be you. You got to figure out you right now and stick with it. So like he said, when I come to spring training, I know me. I know what my swing is, and that's what I'm going to build on uh, from here on out. And that's a component that, you know, after that happens, the mind is is the, the final frontier, as I like to say. A hundred percent. And we're going to talk a little bit about the World Series, too. And then I want to wrap up with just – moving forward a little bit and, and the minor league housing situation, because major league baseball, which we've talked about this in the last few episodes, or at least a few episodes ago, Jeff, about the housing situation, minor league situation in general, major league baseball says that teams are going to provide housing. Uh, but I think with you two together, we can provide some interesting uh, insight as to what that whole situation is like and uh, why it's so big that baseball is finally uh, doing something about it. But first I wanted to talk about, the playoffs in the world series that we're about to enjoy. And I know I have two jerseys to guess, but the one thing I wanted to talk about before with the mental side of things, Cody Bellinger stands out to me above all uh, in this postseason, even though the Dodgers got bounced is he at 160 the entire season. And, you know, I remember texting Griff and being like, what are you seeing with him? Cause we'll just always talk about hitters and, you know, just his timing looked off. I'm sure he wasn't hundred percent. He wasn't healthy. He seemed like he was a little bit in his own head, but all of a sudden he turns the page in the postseason and was phenomenal. I mean, he had a, their season saving to that point, three run shot. He was so locked in. I, I want to start with you, Griff, because you're in it right now and, and you had the hot streaks and, you know, the cold streaks. And can you talk a little bit about how impressive it is for him to be able to turn the page in the postseason and what it takes for a player to do that? Like, is that really the X factor for, for a lot of guys? Because, I mean, this is a guy that won an MVP two years ago. And people were talking about leaving him off the postseason roster. 
uh, when we were going into this off season or into this October. And now he was a big reason why they made it even as far as they did. Yeah. I've thought about it a lot, actually, just about trying to get in his head and like thinking about if it's mechanical, like if he like made a mechanical adjustment going into the postseason, or like if it was more of a mental block, you know, or a mental adjustment that he made. And I go back and forth, but I think, I think, I think for him, it's really mostly mental. Like, I think, I think he really loves, he like loves the big moment, which is like, which is crazy because it's so hard to do what he did because postseason, I mean, the season's hard enough the way guys are throwing these days um, and he's getting carved up, blown up. And then the postseason, everything's elevated. You know, everyone's throwing their best stuff, their best guys, and he's hitting 350. And so you're wondering like, how is that possible? And uh, I'm sure there is mechanical adjustments or, you know, cues or whatever that, that he figured out. But I think, I mean, I think the perfect example is the three run Homer to, yeah. to tie the game in the eighth where here. he was blown up. He, he was missed a foot under a fastball right down the middle. And then the very next pitch, he, it was Oh two. And then he, he climbs the ladder three balls up and hits it out and it swings. It was actually cool. We were at, um, at instructs. We did, the next day after that happened, we got I got a comparison of those two swings. So our hitting uh, one of the hitting guys put it together, and uh, it was it was so cool seeing them side by side because one was like it was just night and day. Like the adjustment was insane. Like I've never seen that big of an adjustment made pitch to pitch like ever. And that just tells me like he literally willed himself to like he missed so far under. He's like I'm not gonna. I know what he's coming with, and there's no way that I'm gonna miss under this pitch. So he was just over, he's probably looking to chop it into the ground realistically, like get a, just get a base hit. And, and it turned out that it was so high that the, the swing he took to get on top of it, like backspun it perfectly. Um, but I think, yeah, I think Bellinger, man, I think he just, he eats that stuff up. Like he loves, he wants to be the guy and, and he loves being the guy. And that's, you know, that's what he's been like, you know, he's just a great postseason player. So it's, it's cool to watch. Two takeaways from that was that you saw a little bit of a uh, mechanical adjustment because he sat into his legs a little bit more than he used to. Cause before it was literally stick straight, like everything was straight up and down. You saw him squat down a little bit. You saw a little bit of bend in his knees to soften things up a little bit, but how about the base hit opposite, opposite way with two strikes in Atlanta? That to me was so anti Cody Bellinger. This guy swings and wants to hit the ball to the moon every single time that bat goes to the zone where this one was, could have been a ball off the plate. He puts it in play in another big situation and gets a base hit where no one's playing. That to me showed that Cody Bellinger was in it mentally and uh, making those adjustments with two strikes to at least put the ball in play. I was just so excited to, to get both of your thoughts on that because it was so amazing to me. I, I gained so much respect for Cody Bellinger after watching this postseason because he seems so lost at times at the plate. And like Griff mentioned, to, to make that between pitch adjustment, I think at times in the regular season, you miss that bat on a pitch. I mean, Griff, you could probably attest to it. You miss that bat on a fastball. You're like, oh, gosh, you know, I'm doomed here in this at bat. Right? It's, it's like this deflating feeling when you're going bad. But he shut it down and was, was ready to go the, the next pitch. And I think that was what was really amazing about it. Despite that, the Dodgers get bounced. And your dad called that. Jeff called that the Dodgers were going to get bounced because I threw a fit after the trade was made with Scherzer and Trey Turner to the Dodgers. I said, baseball's turning into the NBA. And I was complaining about the super team. And your dad's like, it's baseball. I, I, I bet they go down. And yeah, they had some injuries, but they went down. And they, on paper, were still better than every team out there. I want to start with you on this one, Jeff. And then I'm going to guess the jerseys after I get Griff's take on this too, because I'm sure you guys have been watching the postseason together. What has amazed you about this Braves team? And how were they able to overcome their own limitations? Like we talk about the Dodgers injuries. The Braves are missing a top three, maybe top two player in the game in Ronald Acuna. And also their ace to be in Mike Soroka, who missed the whole year. Uh, several other pieces as well. How were they able to do this as a 88 win team? Uh, as someone that's been a part of two world series champions that weren't expected to do what they did either. Um, I think you look, start your investigation uh, with Brent Snitaker and what he's done for that clubhouse and how he's pulled that team together. Uh, he's got arguably one of the biggest gamers uh, that is leading that team in Freddie Freeman. He's been there his whole career. The guy is a gamer. He's a stud. 
He knows how to play the game the right way. And I think he's rallied these guys and taught the young guys how to do the same. Uh, you look at Riley at third base. I mean, this guy is going to be, he's got potential to be a superstar, but he's unfazed by a 24 year old being in these big pressure situations. This guy doesn't, it doesn't matter to him. Albies. I mean, did he step up his game or what after Acuna goes down, you know, and I'm looking at his swing and I'm like, I'm telling the FIU guys today, you know, I'm just talking mechanics with him. I'm like, look at Albies, look at Albies swing. Has anybody been watching the playoffs? They're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, look at Albies swing. And he goes, Oh my God, it's unbelievable. But you know what? He starts way crazy open and he's got this huge leg kick. But I said, watch his head movement when he goes through that entire process of open stance, big leg kick, stride into it. His head does not move. It's crazy. You would think that that thing would be going all over the place. And I always preach to these guys, try to keep your head as still as possible all the time, because when your eyes jiggle around and move, it affects the way you visualize and see the baseball coming in. So I think Snitaker's done a, uh, an amazing job. He's a Bobby Cox disciple who is a um, non-analytics guy. He's an old school baseball guy. He's been in there for 40 years. And this is the first time he's ever been to a World Series. And I'm just happy for him as another old school baseball guy that, that loves to see uh, the way this team is constructed and the way to see this team has played in this, this offseason. They've gotten you know, so many con contributions from guys you wouldn't expect. Uh, Matzik the other night coming in. Cool. I didn't even know this, but Griff, Griff told me he doesn't even play baseball for five years. Wasn't in the major leagues for five years and comes in with arguably two of the biggest innings he's ever thrown in his life or maybe the Atlanta Braves history you know, to uh, shut out the Dodgers and seal that championship we we gave out our predictions for the series and, and Matzik was a big x factor for me because you talk about not being analytically driven with his managing as much and something he did there to go to Matzik left-handed pitcher against a right-handed hitting Albert Pujols who legitimately the only reason he's still on a major league baseball team right now is because he crushes lefties still 950 OPS against lefties 500 and change against righties He's unusable against righties. He crushes lefties. And the first guy that Matzik had to face was Albert Pujols. Snicker didn't care. He went to his guy. He wanted his guy in that spot, and he, got, he went to his guy, and it worked. Griff, you watch now this Braves team do what they did. You also see these teams that, you know, we're told so often, the Rays, even the Dodgers, but a lot of these analytically driven teams that – you know, let's be honest, they script their games out before. You can tell. I mean, two batters or three batters, Roberts is out there and he's switching it up. And you see a guy going on feel like Snicker. And Alex Cora went on feel for a lot of a lot of his managerial decisions. And they exceeded their expectations. Where do you sit with all of this? Because I know you, you pay attention to the advanced stats and you pay attention to everything. But I know you're similar to the way I am where you also – have that core in you that's just like the traditional aspect of the game it has a heartbeat but wh where do you sit with all of this now watching a Braves team make their way to the World Series off a manager on feel and a Rays team that's analytically driven coming up short a little bit because you're kind of immersed in it right now being across a couple of different organizations you've seen a lot of you know different philosophies I guess I would say yeah I think for one thing the Braves I mean it, it's all about who gets high right like that's how you the, once you enter the postseason, like it doesn't matter. Regular season record goes out the window. You know, it's whoever's hottest is, is going to is who's going to make it till the end. And uh, if you look at the Braves lineup, man, they're they're hot. Like they got Jock Peterson, who's he's, he's had a line outs 150 miles per hour, like through the three games I've watched outs. And yeah. he, he's not missing a barrel. Rosario is unbelievable. Oh, we were man. just talking about him the other night about how how gorgeous. I, you, I think was just like explain him effortless. to me, please. I was just like, like, please explain I mean, he's got – he's timed up perfectly. He's got this big kind of gather. Um, but, again, like, it, 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 he stays so still. Like, his hands are moving, and that's how he gets his rhythm. But everything else is, is just perfectly still. And, uh, and he hits 230 with the, with the Indians before he gets traded over. Go figure. And now he's a super stud. He can't get him out. It's they crazy. traded Pablo yeah, Sandoval. Pablo Sandoval was traded for him. Bye-bye. Alex Anthopoulos deserves wow. a, a big time pat on the back too. Uh, I mean, he, he did an amazing job, but yeah. It, what, what do you see here, Griff, from like the Braves philosophy? Do you think it's just a bunch of guys that are just out there hitting and having fun? Like Jock Peterson's rocking pearls, uh, which is, <laughs> which is insane. Um, it's also hilarious, but it, it, there's also the snicker 
fact that he's just owning it. He's, he's literally said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just going on field. What situation would you rather be in as a player in terms of like, the feel managerial balance of both or, or knowing that you have all this data behind it and, and, you know, it's make, you're making the most data driven decision. Uh, like what kind of environment, because every team does it at this point. So how deep do you want to be into it uh, as a, as a player and how much do you think players focus on that? Cause you've seen players like Carlos Correa come out and say, I only look at the advanced stats, but then a lot of other guys don't really pay attention to it at all. Uh, and I think it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition there. I think, I mean, I think you got to have a balance of both, you know, analytics are just the day and age we live in. Like you can't not look at them. You know, I know Snicker obviously is, that's not how he makes his decisions, but I guarantee, you know, there's, they play a role in, in you know, the matchups at least and, and stuff like that. And I think what happened with the Rays is kind of, they didn't have the other half, you know, they didn't have the field. They were, you know, I don't know, you can't break it down to percentages, but they clearly, you know, went more off. I'm going to go with, what the data says rather than like what my eyes are telling me. And I think, you know, he's Snicker does a really good job of like what, you know, managing the situation. I think, I mean, the pinch hit Adrianza had, that's a perfect situation, you know, pulled Anderson who was, he was I dealing. Was, I thought that was he a probably could have thrown reason. three more innings. You know, they got a great pen, but he, he's, he's got them on their, on their heels and uh, pull him, pull him out. And Adrianza, who I don't think he, he's been like a pinch hit guy for them. But I don't think he really in the postseason had done much. And, uh, you know, gets the jam shot double and eventually that leads to a three run homer. So just, and that was, you know, that was the game. That was the whole game, just that pinch hit. So uh, it's really cool watching stuff like that happen. That doesn't as much these days, you know, with, with pinch hits, you know, obviously pinch hitters still have still occur, but I think uh, managerial moves like that don't happen as much. Um, and uh, that was really cool in itself to watch just how that they rallied around that. And then that gave them, you know, the championship win. So uh, I think you got to have both and they got they have both right now. Perfectly. Perfect blend. You know, that's how Jack, that's how Jack McKeon managed in 2003. It was 100% feel obviously because analytics didn't really exist back then for one, but he went with his guys that he knew on that night had the best chance to succeed. And he went with it all the time. And I'll tell you what, man, we, you know, we said he had the golden horseshoe stuck up his ass because every move that he made worked out. And he made some crazy, crazy moves. And we're like all looking at each other in a dugout or on the field. We're like, what the hell is he doing? Sure enough, he put in a reliever to, to sack bunt, which because he didn't want to burn a pinch hitter and uh, a reliever that hadn't even handled a bat the entire year. And he'd lay it down and get him over. Stuff like that happened all year long. And we we're just scratching our heads. And we're like, roll with it, Jack. Just roll with it. We're having, we're having fun. And I think there's almost like this level of confidence too, where you're like, he believes in me in this spot. It's not the computer saying, put oh, this guy no. in. It's like, it's, yeah, he's, he's backing he's, you up. Yeah. Exactly. I feel like if you gave him the analytics, you gave him a bunch of like a stack of papers, he'd just use it to ash his cigar. Yeah. Uh, he'd wipe he his would. butt with it probably. <laughs> but let's get to the jerseys. And then we're going to do some rapid fire questions uh, on both of you guys uh, and your baseball careers. I'll start with Jeff because Jeff's rocking the Braves jersey. And I'm going to guess, I thought we already did him, but I, I'm, we may not have. Is it Chipper Jones? No, actually, dang, that's a good one. That's one of my favorite all-time players. Uh, well, mental and, I, and I think I have him too, but I didn't know. It's not Chipper Jones. Uh, Andrew Jones. Nope. Era. Can I get like a span of 15 years? You're going, you got to go way back. Way back. Oh, okay. Hank Aaron. Wow. You, you just really wanted to flex on us today, huh? <laughs> yes, the late, great Hank Aaron. That is awesome. There it is. There's the auto right across the abdomen. That's a sweet jersey. So I'm that assuming you have, you have the opportunity to meet Hank? I did. And, uh, you know, I, I got this jersey when we were doing all the, you know, going through all the Mitchell and Ness, you know, when they were selling all the old throwback jerseys. I got this one. And uh, took it up to Atlanta and I asked him if he would sign it. And he said, yeah, sure. He goes, would you mind signing a jersey for me for my foundation so I can give it away? And I'm like, I will sign whatever you want me to. So uh, he was very gracious and uh, just one of the nicest men you'll ever meet. And obviously, in my eyes, maybe the greatest baseball player to ever live. Yeah, he was pretty decent. Uh, he, he had a, take he had away a his 714 home or 750. Well, how many do you have? 750? Five. Five. 755 he still had over 3,000 hits yeah I mean it's just 
the definition of consistency. Uh, obviously, Griff and I did not get to see him play, uh, but that's that's a player that you know we always have just known how great he was, especially as Bonds approached that that threshold. It it also brought to light you know just how good. Hank Aaron was, and unfortunately, his passing you know, recently you know brought that back up to light as well of just how how incredible of a career he had and uh, how great he was on and off the field. On the Astros side, honestly, I don't even know what, what Griff would be wearing right now. Can, can you give me give me a span of of I just need a decade? Eighties, 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 eighties Astros. There's there's about there's about three decades. Nolan there. Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Wow. That's not bad for me. Oh, that's a sick one. And by the way, those listening, reminder that these are on YouTube as well. If you're listening on, on Apple or Spotify, you can check it out on YouTube to see the jerseys. What do you think of those jerseys, Jeff? I know Griff definitely likes those jerseys. I, I think they're cool as hell, but they are the most uncomfortable things you're ever going to put on. They are awful. They're oh, so they, they don't breathe, bleed. right? No, no buttons. Nothing. Just, just awful. Uh, now they've got these, high tech um, fabrics that, you know, are breathable and you wick sweat and all this, but these guys and this, they played in wool before this oh. wool uniforms, which I've talked to some of the guys that, you know, signed these things for me. And they said that was the absolute most uncomfortable thing you could possibly do is play baseball during the summer, during the day in a wool outfit. They didn't have, like, night, games huh? they didn't have night games either. So it's just miserable. Yeah. I almost miserable. think you look at like, when people are, make the pitching argument about how they don't know how guys back then would have played today, it almost like cancels out because they because <laughs> it's that bad. Like canvas. It feels like painting canvas. It's awful. And those guys were going going 190, 200 pitches in that wool. In, oh yeah, wool sheath. Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. So Nolan Ryan, you did yeah, you had to have overlapped with him, right? You I faced him. Bats, I got three at bats off Nolan Ryan. How'd you do? I'm in his book. For for strike, good reason or bad reason. Book. I'm one of the five thousand two hundred and book. whatever. Oh, it's, that's a long one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. When I faced him, he's forty. I think he's forty three years old and still throwing ninety five. Back when ninety five was so rare, it was incredible. But he was forty three, still throwing ninety five, and his curveball was a joke. And still kicking ass too. I was his thinking curveball was a joke. How yeah. and his changeup too. I mean. He had three pitches that were, well, he still got, the, I think, the lowest uh, hits per nine of any pitcher in history. Unbelievable. And, and that's somebody that I've gone back and watched his video so many times. Just It's amazing how he just had a rubber arm. Uh, but kind of going oh, off he, of that. He also, hold, he also holds a record for most major league service time, a pitcher. Yeah. 27 years. 27 pit, years in the big leagues. How, like, how is that? What, what did he do? How did that arm? That's just, that's just freak. He's freak. a freak. It's nothing shy of freak, a million. but he's a badass freak. <laughs> seriously. And to piggyback off of that though, like he's one of those guys that could pitch in any era and probably 30 years from now could pitch against the aliens. That'll be throwing one Oh eight consistently or whatever. It's going to happen with major league baseball by then. But a lot of what Griffin just kind of mentioned that's a big talking point now is it's so hard to really compare eras and guys today are just doing things that we've never seen you got to go see Griff playing double A. And I mean, the talent even in high A is great, but I said all year, I called, I called high A to double A the great separator because I thought that compared to almost any other year, it was as big of a jump as ever because of no season last year, you had a lot of talent kind of packed into the upper levels of the minors and the jump to double A was insane. I mean, every single day I checked the box score, I, I knew the guy on the mound that Griff was facing uh, because he was, you know, a high profile type of pitcher and it was just, it was endless. And he had to face those guys, you know, for, for a six game series. What was it like for you to see that in person now? You know, you remember what it was like in your playing days and now seeing what Griff had to go up against uh, this year. I mean, how different is it? It's night and day. It's absolutely night and day. I mean, I remember when Griff first signed, went to Vancouver and who's that team you guys were playing the series we went uh, to tri city, the Padres. Oh my God. They had literally Five guys throw in one night. I think the lowest velo I saw was 94, and their closer came in at 101. This is a short season A ball team. 94 to 101 is what he faced in short season A ball team from the Padres. And I'm like, 
that would have been that would have rivaled the best arms of any single team that I saw in the major leagues during my career, let alone on a low season or a single or a short season A ball team. And then, of course, they keep getting better. So you get to double A this year. Uh, we went to Beloit and saw those arms. You get to double A and it's just every single night, um, you know, the, the quality of the arms they've got thrown at you is is staggering. I mean, it's just but, you know, that becomes more the norm for him where for me, you know, 88 was the norm. So that's my speed. That's my hitting speed is 88. Well, now his hitting speed is 94. So you've got less time to react, but that's what you see every single night. So that's kind of what you're used to. Um, and then you get those aberration guys that throw 100. And for me, it was 95, 96. That for me was like, wow, nobody threw 100 back then. I mean, what's amazing to me, though, is you look at somebody like Brute Star Gratterall. And he's throwing 103 with movement, with movement. Yet he doesn't get the swings and swing and miss numbers that you would expect. Yeah, hey, Griff, you, you've probably faced some some freak shows like that at this point. Maybe not 103 with sync, but can you kind of contextualize how? I mean, I think part of the reason is is what your dad says about the new norm, right? You you get you almost become a little bit desensitized to this insane velo. But how is 103 with sync not getting? a 98% whiff rate. Like he's throwing wiffle balls, but I mean, he's had a, he had a great postseason. He seemed to figure out how to overlay his stuff, but he had but a I mean, this was, during the season. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't anything crazy. I was shocked when I saw that stat. My, uh, I have like a pretty baseless theory, but I think he gets so little extension like from the mound because he, he has like no follow through, which just makes him even more of a freak. Like it's all rotator cuff. That's a, it's taken the whole brunt of his throwing motion. Um, and it helps that he's, you know, 250 or 260 pounds or whatever he's listed at, which I did not realize he was that thick of a guy. But um, I was, I'm wondering if like maybe his complete lack of extension kind of gives like, you're just getting the hitter more room to see. So it probably plays down a little. It's still insane. And I think it's just a testament to like, hitter preparation these days, you know, and what they can do. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they got um, the machine going as hard as it'll go and kind of mimicking his, his pitches. Cause they know he's, you know, he's the guy out of the pen, same with Trinan. Um, so guys, and also it seems like it, um, it stays pretty true as far as like the boot. It's not really um, it's, it's left to right. Like, like Trinan goes hard down. So that seems like it's more, it's it, his more of a barrel on a similar, it stays, yeah it stays on a similar plane so I, I i would guess that's why he doesn't get um the crazy swing and misses that he should um it kind of makes it easier to put it in play when it's staying on on one plane whereas trying and kind of has dual planes going where his you know, slider he, he puts up the numbers you'd expect gratter all to put up his slider is a legit wiffle ball it, it's the crazy well, your dad and i've talked about that one quite a bit um and the the other player yeah i look at some of the older guys we were watching that 86 Mets documentary, like Mike Scott, he had some of that going on for him, but he was scuffing the baseballs and stuff, which was, which was pretty interesting. And that, that was a great documentary too, uh, which was a ton of fun to watch. Yeah. We got to uh, watch that. That, that was, that was a blast, but like those little things, he, he had to scuff baseballs back then. I guess that's like what guys were doing with the spider tack, but now you have a bit, bit of the crackdown and it's still really insane though. You don't really see that much of a difference in stuff, a little bit less spin, but overall it's, it's insane stuff. But going into these two teams now, and then we'll wrap up with a couple of quick questions about each of you guys. The Braves obviously have a lot going for them. The Astros are one of the best offenses I think we've seen in the modern era. I mean, you look at the highest WRC plus, I think about advanced stats, but that's like my favorite one. And it really just makes an even playing field and gauges all offensive stats and kind of compiles it into like a super score. And they are in the top five over the last 20 years of all teams, they have three of the best seasons. It's this year, 2017 and 2019. It's the same offense, give or take a couple guys. And they've all they've done is add Jordan Alvarez to that 2017 team. They lose George Springer and they add Michael Brantley. This is one of the best hitting teams I think I've ever seen. It's unbelievable to watch. Starting with Griff this time, you're watching these guys hit. I mean, just from top to bottom, their first seven guys, Kyle Tucker hit seventh. That's really all I have to leave it at is Kyle Tucker hit seventh most of the season for that team. Like, that, that's absurd. What amazes you about the consistency top to bottom in this lineup? And um, 
is there one hitter that you like to watch the most in that with that team? Because I could I can marvel at almost all of them. Um, you know, for whatever reason, I don't watch the Astros a whole lot, to be honest. I don't Me know neither. why. I don't know why. It's not nothing to do with the cheating scandal. I don't really, you know, I just like swings. And for whatever reason, I don't, I don't like. It's a lot of good swings over there. I know. I don't know why. I just, uh, I don't know. It's hard to explain why. I just, uh, I mean, the Correa, Correa is always, you know, he's insane. I think he's, he's just so explosive. Like his swing is vicious and and to still have that much control of like the strike zone and, um, and, uh, can I hit, hit, be able to hit all pitches, uh, is, is fun to watch. I would say my guy would be Brantley. I he's love watching good. Brantley because it's insane how he hits. He, he doesn't move. And he's we talk about not good. moving your head. He doesn't move his whole body. He stays completely, which is like, I don't think people don't realize how hard that is to do. Like I've tried it. I've tried at one point during the year. I was like, I wasn't like, I'm going to hit like Brantley, but I was like, I'm going to just, like, I'm just going to stop moving. Cause then I'll be able to see it more. And then I'd watch video and I would move. I would completely move. You know, I wouldn't be close to like what Brantley did. Um, so that just takes so much practice and discipline to, to master. And then it's no wonder why, you know, he sit, he hits 300 every year because he does the same thing every time. And he's got a really smooth, smooth swing. And still has pop even with, with, uh, with such little movement. Um, yeah. Kyle Tucker uh, had a really good year. And I think he's, you know, every, everything that I've seen about his swing and, you know, he's, he's a pretty unique swing and approach and um, yeah. really I never watched him a lot. And then having played with Connor Scott, um, there, there is a lot of similarities. And I think I kind of see where they're coming from. And I think that's, you know, their hopes is he'll turn into that. Um, and uh, I mean, he's still super young, you know, there's no telling, you know, what he, what he can do. And uh, it's also interesting that his, his sister dates Kyle Tucker. So no like way. somewhat close. Yeah. They went to the same high school, Tampa plant high and, school. Yeah, in Tampa. I, didn't, I didn't know that either. So now it's kind of making more sense. And they like have similar left handed similar left-handed swings very similar like he clearly watched him a lot and and saw yeah. a lot of things he liked and um i didn't know that i, mean, I like his swing a lot too uh, and, and tucker tucker wasn't a guy that instantly hit the ground running you know in, in the mlb level you know it took a little bit of time for him and i think that's something that people don't realize austin riley did not hit the ground running it took him some time most of these guys it takes to 300 at bats sometimes to to, to really get acclimated at the, the big league level. And that's what made what Wander Franco did, by the way, just so absurd. He was the craziest I've ever seen. But Jordan Alvarez, he's got the physical stature that you just can't teach. I went that's to the... the guy, I watch Jordan. I should have said that. Yeah. I do. Uh, he's the guy I watch the most because he's he, a lefty, big lefty, like awesome swing. Like I like watching him a lot. I sat on top of the monster uh, for the ALCS and he went yard oppo basically over the monster in right center. And I was just watching that ball carry towards me. It went like right over me. And just to see what he did with where that pitch was and how he drove it to where I was standing. And it was just like kind of what your dad says about you is to be able to hit the ball that deep and drive it the other way that far. There's just certain things that you just can't teach. And Jeff, you haven't watched the Astros. Now I'm going to, I'm going to get like ask you for your thoughts next time on the Astros, but on the brave side, then. Freddie Freeman, you got Riley, as you mentioned before. What really stands out with you? You talked about Albies already. I want to hear a little bit about Riley because Freeman, to me, you look at his swing, it, it's just it's just perfect. Like he just he makes it work and he's got such a good approach. Riley, you said really impressed you. What have you seen kind of click for him in this postseason? Because he was a guy that was really struggling through his first two big league seasons, like big time. He's just, uh, you know, he's a big stature guy. He's like 6'4", I think 240, 6'3", 240. He's a big dude. Um, but it's it's a very simplistic approach. I mean, he doesn't have much of a leg kick, uh, great balance. Um, it's just my kind of swing. You know, uh, I'm still trying to grasp the whole leg kick thing with a lot of these guys, especially at FIU, saying, I don't care if you got a leg kick or not. It's fine, 100% fine. If you get it back down to the ground before you need to swing, then – and it's early enough, that's fine. I, like I said, it doesn't matter how you start, it's how you finish. Um, but I think his is just a textbook uh, positioning of his hands, uh, the way he strides, everything for me is, is textbook. And it's just a simple approach. That I think it's easily repeatable and, and we could be watching this kid for a long time. Uh, I agree. And we're going to wrap up with both your World Series predictions. But first, a couple quick rapid fire questions. See how well Griff knows 
his own dad's baseball career. We we're talking about who's faster. <clears throat> and I guess we'll have to find out once Griff gets to the big leagues and gets a full season under his belt. Do you know what the total number of stolen bases is, Griff, that you will have to eclipse to be better than your dad in that department in one season? The single season stolen base mark that you have to beat. Single Wait, season. for what? Are we talking about minors or big leagues? Big leagues. He ain't touching my minor league numbers. Yeah, he he he, he, he always reminds me he had a good he had a 30. You had a 30 spot in the minors. You had a 30 uh, spot in the minors? Which is true. I will not touch that. 20, uh, 26, 32, 21, my first three years. How? We had a manager that loved to run. He said, go, just keep on going. And I learned how to read pitchers. What was your dad's uh, career high in stolen bases? I want to say uh, in the, one of the very first years when he was still limber. <laughs> uh 16 15 one of those close but the correct answer is 12 and it actually was in his age with i have it right here hold on his age 35 season all right 12 bags that's shocking that's shocking there must have been some tells you were seeing or something Maybe some big, big my, like Mike Hargrove. Mike Hargrove liked to run too, and he would give us the green light, and I would, I'd take advantage of it. You know what, though? I, I will say 12 for 20. Mm. So. Yeah. <laughs> See, why, why would you do that to me right now? Why well, would you do that? 20. Seriously, why can't you just give it at 12? <laughs> I was gonna ask, I was gonna say, how many caught? We talked, how about? many caught? Another one for you, Griff. Your dad had two seasons, and we're going to go advanced stats on this one because I tried to stump your dad early in the podcast, the first couple episodes we did, because I know he doesn't like pay attention to like the advanced stats as most players don't, and even a lot of them I don't even dive too deep into. So I was like, I'm going to quiz you on your own advanced stats and to see which years if he could get it and, and, and have enough of an idea. What year do you think your dad had the best WRC plus? And what do you uh, think it was? <clears throat> Well, I don't even know. I don't. I don't know our WRC plus. You don't like, really. Yeah, like I don't know what that number looks like. Is it a hundred something? Hundred is average. Okay. Every okay. I did. One I over to... is right. above average. I'm pretty sure you were among the league leaders in the minors for a large portion of the season in that regard. Okay. Okay. I, I remember seeing that now. Um, I would say it's got to be 94, 95. I'd say 94. And I'd say it was one, one thirty-two. Wow! So it was ninety-five, and it was one thirty-four. Wow! Ninety-four. Wow. He was one thirty-three. That's wow. pretty impressive. Wow. That's pretty damn wow. impressive. Crazy enough, his best WAR season was ninety-six, which is wins above replacement, which is your dad's favorite stat. Um, <laughs> Back to, oh, tough. by the way, I gained access to Synergy and I can pull specific videos. And there was one video that I was able to pull from, from Griffin. I can pull any I want, but there was one that you were in. And it was in the Super Regional. This is the, the trivia question on Griff. On that draft day, he hit a couple home runs. Do you remember where of course you're going to remember this i'm just trying to like pump griff up because i can't ask him like i can't ask you specific stats on griff where did the home run that he hit to right field land at georgia uh it was over the scoreboard i remember that um on top of the scoreboard was yeah. the answer and that was his second home run of that game right that was first that was the first one the other one went to straight dead center field uh it looked like a fly ball to me, but it just kept on going and going. The guy kept going back and then it ended up in the trees back in uh, and just to the left of the batter's eye in center field. I had to just throw that one in there, but my real Griffin trivia question is this. How many home runs does your son have in 245 minor league games? Um, Mm. 65 no way you got it 
Boom. Six, five bombs. Math major. Boom. Math wow. Major. That's pretty good. Oh, Lucy loves Lucy the clock too. Lucy agrees. Lucy, stop. Come on. 65 homers. You got it. I'm going to give one more question each and then your World Series predictions. On, of course, Jeff's side now. By the way, did you know you set you had the league lead in sacrifices one year? Um, pretty pretty cool stat, Jeff. I'm, you know, personally, I broke Griffin's record, career record at Pinecrest for sacrifices. So I sit in the record. Flies, you're talking about right? It it's total. It takes both bunt and flies into well, account. I never bunted, so it was all yeah. sacrifice flies. Twelve sacrifice flies. I, I, I live in immortality at Pinecrest for the all-time sacrifice. <laughs> in the record leader. books, gamer. Gamer, I was just willing to do whatever it takes. <laughs> Your dad already said how many home runs he had, because that would have been the next question I would have asked. So I have another one ready for you here to go. What was your dad's career strikeout rate? And you just have to be within 2%. Mm. Um, I It's pretty, pretty, pretty low. Uh, I would say that's tough because it's tough. Strikeout rate's tough because it's a. Uh, I would say seventeen percent. So that's your final guess. Yeah, is that off? It's pretty close. It's honestly, I would have guessed lower, frankly, and literally Fangraphs is like synthesizing it right now. But the final answer is actually fifteen percent. 15%? He got, within, he got the plus or minus. He got the plus or minus 8.6% walk rate. 54 stolen bases, 29 caught. Why? Why say the negative stuff? Just let's start with the positive stuff. And this is one that you're going to have to like think back a little bit, I guess. How many home runs did Griffin have in his collegiate career in 156 games? Hmm. I'm going to say um, 40. Ooh, he overshot you. I think you forgot 30. the donut. I think you forgot the donut freshman year. 31. Well, huh? 31. 31. 13. Disappointing. Yeah. None. You're no. Nope. Oh, shoot. Donut. His first four year. years. I was like, damn, I'm missing a couple of sophomore year. I can't remember sophomore year, and I – yeah. In your defense, if you add the Cape League homers, he has even 40. There you go. That's what sure. I was thinking. That's that what was you're thinking about, year. right? That was a sophomore year right there. It actually and then was, so. one, one bonus question for Griff. What's the highest your dad ever finished in MVP voting? Ooh. Uh, um – 12 overshot. I like you. You guys are both gassing each other up. 18th oh. was, was the spot. 1994, 95. 94, he finished 18th, 95. He finished 22nd. The players ahead of him, Greg Jeffries, Craig Biggio, Hal Morris, Dante Bichette, Marquise Grissom, someone you've mentioned before in the podcast before Kevin Mitchell, Fred McGriff, Tony Gwynn, Mike Piazza. Those guys were all right. Greg Maddox, Barry Bonds. He's Pretty decent. Matt Williams. Interesting name too. I'm not expecting that one. He was there. having he a really good year. He was having one of the most monster seasons in '94 when we had to shut it down. It was crazy. I would love to see what he ended up with that year. And then before the predictions, Griff, your favorite player to watch when you used to watch your dad play growing up. I don't know if you remember anybody who was your favorite player on the team besides your dad. Um, I've already gotten gotten shit from your dad for saying that Dontrell was my favorite Marlin. So be careful. <laughs> Uh, that's a good one. I would say he didn't like baseball when, when I was playing. Yeah. I know he was skateboarding and stuff. Um, I guess it was technically after he finished, it was right after he finished. So, but Dan Ugla loved Dan Ugla. Four arms guy. Yeah. He gave you his cleats, didn't he? He was good to him too. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He was cool. He was awesome. Did you ever use those? Of course. I wore them for the Rattlers. Probably the whole year. You wore Dan Uggles. Didn't go with the colors at all. Wait, wait. You wore Dan Uggles cleats at the age of twelve? Yeah, he was size nine. 
Yeah, small foot. <laughs> size nine. Wow. They're awesome cleats. It sucked because I grew out of them in like in like a month. Wow. <laughs> I only got a month out of them. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. World cool Series predictions now. As one of you is wearing the Astros, the other is wearing the Braves. Is that representative of the prediction or who are we going with? I'll start with you, Jeff. I'm wearing my prediction. I just think uh, they got too much going for them right now as far as a unit, as a team. Reminds me a lot of the 2003 team that we had, just the way they've come together here at the end and the way guys are contributing up and down the lineups and the pitching staff all coming up in big situations. I'm going Braves in six. In six. I had Braves in seven. What do you have, Griff? I hate to be the same, but I have the same. That was actually my – I saw – it would have been – Tougher call, but Lance McCullers going down, that's kind of – that's big. Yeah. He's, he's a big game pitcher, and he would have been huge for him. So, uh, him not being able to throw, that kind of shifted things. Gave I agree. Up hand, and they're, you know, as hot as they are right now. It just seems like it's their year. Don't even know who's throwing game three for, for the Astros at this point. I, nope. There's no way it could be Zach Granke at this point. So, it, it'll be very interesting to see where they go there. And I almost forgot this, so I can't let you go yet. Ken Griffey Jr. became a minority owner of the Seattle Mariners today, which is pretty damn cool. Very, very cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. You have a cool story, which you're probably, you're probably tired of telling, but I don't really get sick of it. When <laughs> your dad was with the Reds playing with Griffey, in this same phase of when you didn't like baseball that much, you also had a mop for hair. Just, just ridiculous mop that covered your face and – Ken Griffey wanted to get rid of it, I think, right? Can you briefly well, tell that well, story as we wrap up? The initial guy was Adam Dunn. That's who really started it. But well, Adam yeah. Dunn hated it. Hated it. Yeah, two, two superstars. Do you players. remember the story? or did? Yeah, yeah. I remember. I can still actually really remember it. <laughs> tell it. He's asking. Um, yeah, Adam Dunn. I was, how old was I? I was probably 10. I was 10. I was 10, so I was in peak uh, I was in peak skateboarding phase at that point. So a little thing about skateboarding, the hair is big. It's an important part of it. Half the battle. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it might be even be more. It might be 70%. So that was my identity at that point. You know, I felt like he was asking me, you know, can I cut off your identity? So 10-year-old <laughs> me said absolutely not. And he offered, I think it was a grand, um, which meant nothing to me as a 10-year-old. I was like, that's you know, I'd I didn't have anything to do with money at that age. I guess in hindsight, <laughs> your dad showed hindsight, the, yeah, get that off me. But at the time, that was the most important thing to me. So didn't bat an eye at it. Just kind of dismissed it. Then Griffey comes in and says he'll he'll match his grand. So now we're looking at two grand. And oh. uh, yeah, nothing doing. wasn't wasn't feeling it. wasn't wasn't leaving my head until it was time. And you know, eventually it was. But didn't even flinch. Nope. Didn't flinch. Didn't think about it. Didn't think twice. Didn't think once. What if that Thank offer you. was made now? I would, I mean, yeah, I would shave my head. I would do anything. For two grand. <laughs> For two grand. It was especially, I think, what goes beyond that is if Ken Griffey was telling me that. Ken Knowing Griffey now, like, my head. Ken Griffey is a legend. And I, I just didn't even, I didn't, like, know baseball enough. I didn't watch it enough to, like, realize that. And Adam Dunn, for that matter. I mean, that guy almost had 500 homers, so. But um, God forbid, if Tony Hawk said it, if Tony Hawk wanted to shave your head, oh yeah, yeah I might have done it. I might have done it because he didn't have the flow, and that could have <laughs> that would have registered more with me. But uh, yeah, that's that's a funny story. Unreal. Well, that's one of my favorite stories. Of course, you didn't end up cutting the hair. Griffey moved on to just hitting 600 home runs, and uh, Adam Dunn hit 500, I believe. Right? He finished 500, or no, just shy, 400 and change, and yeah. a lot of strikeouts. But really good career. That was a pretty cool team that you had over there in Cincinnati. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing Votto that was, was on that team too, wasn't he? Votto was a rook. That was his rookie year. Hamilton. Hamilton. Oh, Hamilton was there that year. That was a yeah. That was actually a really cool team. So as we a lot wrap of story up, storylines going on. A lot yeah. of storylines. A lot of storylines there for sure. A lot of storylines for there, and, and a lot of uh, historic players. We'll definitely do this again, and we'll be able to do. I'll have way more trivia ready to go, and also just looking forward to following up with both of you guys as things go on of course your dad's in school uh so i know he's probably got homework to do it's already getting i got an 87 on my midterm yesterday you got an 87 on your midterm that's really good congratulations good shot b plus yeah (laughs) you 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 switching sides here griff is like kind of a role reversal yeah 
He's telling yeah. me to get my ass in the <laughs> yeah, to get studying study my, for my work, get my yeah. work done. Yeah. Well, I love it. It's so much fun. And we'll, we'll do this again for sure. Thank you guys both. I'll see you in a few weeks. I'm coming home for Thanksgiving. We'll get after it in the cage. Got to see the FIU facilities. It was awesome. Can't wait to go back. And I can't wait for opening day. Uh, I'll see both you guys soon. And all those listening, thank you for listening. World Series is underway. We'll have an opportunity to talk to hopefully both you guys again, or at least Jeff will be back to talk about some of these World Series games as we move forward because my X Factor, the definition of a gamer, Charlie Morton, is going to come up big in Game 7. Just mark that down right now. Uh, But looking forward to talking about it. And uh, until next time. All right, brother. See you, bud.